Hi all, my name is Ryan and welcome to my channel What The Pop, where we discuss pop culture in general and Buffy a lot. If you like what I do, please like, subscribe and click the notification bell to be notified whenever I upload a new video. If you have friends that like Buffy, share it with them. It all helps the algorithm and consider supporting the channel through our Patreon. The usual spoiler alert, I may talk about things in these analyses that relate to future plot points. So if you don't like spoilers, I suggest you uh, like the channel and come back after you have seen all of Buffy. Today, we continue our look at Season 2 with Episode 4, Inca Mummy Girl. A plot summary. Buffy's mum signed up for getting an exchange student for two weeks despite the fact that she's always busy and never around. Buffy's is a boy named Empada and Xander turns into a jealous knobhead when he finds out that fact. They're at the museum, looking at the mummy display. Rodney is playing with an exhibit. Willow gets him to stop. Later on, Rodney tries to steal the seal on the mummy, breaks it, and the mummy gets him. Rodney just learned that actions have consequences. Next day, Xander and Buffy are talking about Willow when she walks in. She says Rodney never made it home. They joke, but realise it's probably true. Investigate the museum. Get attacked by a sword-wielding Incan. Holy crap, it's Jacob's dad from Twilight. Willow realises the mummy has braces and that Rodney got sucked dry. Buffy's like to pick up Amparta and Parta gets dead. Mummy takes his place. Mummy and Parta is hot. Xander thinks she's a MILF. Back at school, Giles asks Amparta if she can decipher the seal. She says it says something about bodyguard, but you should destroy it. Not shady at all. Xander escorts Amparta around, talks about his spongy, cream-filled Twinkie, which he then proceeds to give her to shove hole in her mouth. Not a penis reference at all. Jacob's dad attacks again, but they get away. Giles comes to a realisation that the mummy killed Rodney, something we had pretty much established when they found his desiccated corpse and the mummy was gone. Willow is mopey, but wants Xander to be happy, so tells him to take Amparta to the dance. And Parta kills Jacob's dad when he confronts her alone. At the dance, Oz sees Willow in her Inuit outfit, which equals immediate attraction. And Parta starts to desiccate, needs to drain someone else, chooses Jonathan. She starts draining Xander, but stops because she loves him, and runs off to stop Giles from reassembling the seal. Buffy and Parta fight, Xander offers himself instead of Willow, and Parta says, okay. Buffy tears off her arms. Uh, so this is the Buffy take on another classic horror movie, um, The Mummy, and is another episode that is really quite badly written. There are very few episodes of Buffy that are Xander-centric that are actually good, the Zeppo being the only one that immediately comes to mind. This one bears a lot in common with Teacher's Pet, and suffers from all the same problems that Teacher's Pet uh, had. We get another obvious villain that, despite a whole cavalcade of obvious clues, takes the Scoobies forever to figure out who the mummy is. Buffy and Giles in this episode border on the moronic. Probably the worst part, as I mentioned in the summary, was when Giles came to the realisation that the mummy killed Rodney and announced it like it was some massive revelation in their research. I mean, they found the seal broken, the real mummy gone, and Rodney in its place, now a desiccated mummy himself. It was quite obvious at that point in time that the mummy did it. As a viewer, when Giles makes his revelation, it's one of the biggest no-shit Sherlock moments I have ever had watching Buffy. So rather than better writing to create a good mystery for our Scoobies to solve, the writers have just made our Scoobies stupider than usual, <laughs> meaning that things that are blatantly obvious pass them by. While Willow is mostly awesome in this episode, showing a maturity quite beyond her years, she has a moment when the writers completely miss her character. The mopey, the boy doesn't want me moment in the middle of a mummy mystery? Well, normal Willow, normal Willow wouldn't be losing focus on the mummy mystery to mope about any boy, so it seems completely out of character in this episode when she does. On top of that, the plot doesn't make any sense. And Amparta is, is sacrificed to supposedly protect her people from some evil. But when Amparta rises, that evil isn't freed. Unless Amparta herself was the evil or contained the evil. But if that was the case, when Buffy killed Amparta, that evil should have been released. It was no longer contained. 
So from a narrative perspective, that plot line, like most of this episode, was quite poor. Having said that, this episode is far more watchable than ones like Teacher's Pet. In terms of what's good about this episode, well again we have some great quippy dialogue. One of my favourites, though not my favourite quote in this episode, is this one. I wasn't going to use violence. I don't always use violence. Do I? The important thing is, you believe that. This episode also introduces fan favourite Oz, who, and as someone who has seen all of Buffy, it makes you feel good knowing the interactions and lines that will come from his presence in the show. Seth Green, who plays him, is one of the only people to star in both Buffy the movie and the TV show. He has worked with Alison Hannigan before, so they were quite comfortable with each other um, already, and he and Sarah Michelle have known each other and been friends since they were young, so it's no surprise he was able to so easily fit into this cast. We also get the introduction of Jonathan, the nerdy uh, loner whom Amparta almost drained at the bronze, who makes regular appearances throughout Buffy from here on. There is absolutely no subtlety in the comparison between Buffy and Amparta in this episode. It gets hammered throughout. Chosen one, chosen one, chosen one. We get it. They are both chosen ones who are essentially sacrificed for the greater good. We have to remember that Buffy lives an awfully long life as a Slayer compared to most Slayers. Most of them die quite young. So they are essentially a production line of chosen girls to be sacrificed for the greater good. We find Buffy chafing a bit under Giles' watchiness, pushing back against him when he says she can't go to the dance. She says... Giles, come on, budge. No one likes a non-budger. Fine! Go. Yay, I win. I'll just go and introduce my shoulder to a, an ice pack. Once again, Buffy isn't really chafing over being the chosen one so much as she is annoyed at the rigidity with which the patriarchy, the Watchers Council, controls her. She gets Giles to bend here, so she is happy. Shortly after, we are introduced to the mummy um, and she wants a normal life, something that we know Buffy has always wanted. Of course, by this point, Mparta has already killed two people, so that normality is already slightly askew. We learn that the mummy was also a chosen one, a teenage girl, like the Slayer, chosen to keep the netherworld at bay, somehow through her sacrifice. It's all very vague and makes absolutely no sense, because like everything else in this episode, it's just lazy writing. But Amparta does get to experience a normal life. She gets to hang with friends, fall for a boy, eat Twinkies, go to a dance. And if it weren't for that whole pesky mummy thing requiring, requiring her to drain someone to death every few hours, and a guard trying to get her back in her tomb, uh, she would have been happy. A glimpse at the normality that Buffy could have had if it weren't for her calling as the one girl in the, all the world. Surprisingly, despite Amparta having killed two people by the time we meet her, we sympathise with her. Now most of that is because we readily identify her plight as being similar to Buffy. And we all want Buffy to have a happy ending. But essentially, Amparta is a vampire. Sure, she doesn't drain blood to feed, but she drains life force to sustain her, which kills the person she drains it from. So it's essentially the same thing. Now we feel sympathetic towards Amparta because of the whole, she was chosen, she didn't have a choice, it was her destiny thing. But when it comes down to it, how is that any different to a vampire? Most people don't choose to be a vampire. It is the choice of the vampire who sires them. So why then do we feel sympathy for Amparta, and not for all the vampires in the show? As I said before, the main reason is because of the obvious comparison to Buffy. By framing Amparta's situation of being a chosen one in exactly the same words as Buffy's situation as the Slayer, we apply our sympathy for Buffy to Amparta. But the major difference between Buffy and Amparta come down, comes down to the choices they make. When Buffy was faced with death as a result of her destiny, she embraced it. And Parta, on the other hand, uh, doesn't just choose the opposite. She has to kill to maintain it, draining the life out of people in order to stay normal. 
And though she says she wants to experience love and everything she missed out on, she ultimately chooses her life over those experiences when she goes to drain Xander. So Amparta loses that sympathy when she acts in a very un-Buffy-like manner. Her decisions are selfish, whereas Buffy's are mostly selfless. Both Buffy and the Incan princess found themselves as unwilling participants in an unfair yet similar patriarchal system. The Incan princess was chosen as a virgin sacrifice to protect her people from the netherworld. Buffy was chosen by the patriarchal process that decides that a young girl, usually a virgin simply by virtue of her age, would be selected to fight the forces of evil, effectively joining a line of virgin sacrificed uh, virgin sacrifice to protect the world. Now fantasy, particularly in Western society, has an obsession with the virgin sacrifice, particularly female virgins. Uh, as a series, Buffy and Angel weren't free from this. We see it here with Amparta, and we'll see it again in the next episode, Reptile Boy. But at least these shows make this commentary on it in Angel Season 2 episode, The Shroud of Ramon. Why is it always virgin women who have to do the sacrificing? For purity, I suppose. This has nothing to do with purity. This is all about dominance, buddy. You can bet if someone ordered a male body part for religious sacrifice, the world would be atheist like that. We often get in anthropology uh, people, mostly men, talking about female beauty and virginity in sacrifice. Now, to be fair, this isn't usually anthropologists themselves saying these things, but how their findings are often reported by media. For instance, when talking about the sacrificial mound at Cahokia, the women had been reported as unblemished, and that apparent experts speculated that they were virgins. A reporter on Cahokia titled his article, Sacrificial Virgins of the Mississippi, and added that the women in the mound were quite possibly selected for their beauty. So we now have the beautiful virgin sacrifice trope that abounds throughout fantasy uh, and mythology. My earliest memory of this is the original Clash of the Titans movie, a uh, blending and retelling of Greek mythology. In that movie Andromeda, a beautiful virgin is to be sacrificed to the Kraken to appease the sea goddess nymph Thetis, played by the fantastic Dame Maggie Smith. Of course, in classic fantasy trope fashion, the virgin sacrifice is saved by the hero Perseus. However, virgin sacrifices are not historically accurate. There is very little evidence that suggests sacrifices have to be virgins or females. Of the remains in Cahokia, originally, only half could have their biological sex determined, and only half of them were female. So even back then, the notion of the female virgin sacrifice didn't hold up. At somewhere like Chichen Itza, most of the sacrifices were males and children between the ages of 3 and 11. The virgin sacrifice is a hangover of puritanical values influencing how history is perceived. And we see how those values influence pop culture. In horror in pop culture, virginity is valued. It is often a perceived commodity of the heroine, a mark of her purity and the reason she survives. One needs to be pure to fight evil and sex makes you impure. As such, sex in the horror genre is a no-no. Your virginity must be maintained. This cliché got to the point where you knew in horror that if a character had sex, they were going to die. This became so cliché that it was one of the rules of surviving a horror movie in 1996's Scream. While Buffy often butt classic horror tropes, its demonising of sex wasn't one of them. As mentioned in prior analyses, the theme of this season is couples and sex and our hero will be punished for her burgeoning sexuality, for having sex, uh, and I'll discuss that in depth at that point in time. But a big part of that punishment is because she is no longer a virgin sacrifice to keep evil at bay. In fact, her having sex unleashes evil. We will see when we meet Kendra, the slayer that was called when Buffy initially died, that she is not even supposed to talk to boys as dictated by her watcher, thus maintaining her purity as a virgin sacrifice a role she fulfills at the end of the season. Contrast that to Faith, Buffy's what-if dark side in season 3, who is overtly sexual and subsequently bad. Xander actively works to maintain Buffy's purity, becoming a complete dickbag whenever the thought of Buffy with another man happens. 
We see that on display here in this episode when he finds out that Ampata, the exchange student, is male. Of course, he's an absolute hypocrite and is immediately uh, all over Ampata when she's female and attractive. But the message to Buffy in this episode is a simple warning. Amparta escaped her role as the virgin sacrifice and indulged her sexuality. Giving over to those feelings resulted in death. The implication here is that if Buffy does the same, if she stops being the pure virgin sacrifice and indulges her emerging sexuality, that death will be the result. An outcome we see later in this season. Amparta is supposedly derived from Ampara, which means protector, or defender, or shield. So Amparta is linked to Buffy further as a protector of her people. Of course, this link falls down due to the bad writing of this episode, as Amparta was the name of the exchange student that was killed by the mummy, not the mummy itself. We never found out the mummy's actual name. My favourite quote in this episode is this. Well, you know... I have a choice. I can spend my life waiting for Xander to go out with every other girl in the world until he notices me, or I can just get on with my life. Good for you. Well, I didn't choose yet. Thank you for watching. If you've enjoyed this look into the Buffyverse, please like, subscribe to the channel, and consider supporting through our Patreon. If you've disagreed with anything I said, uh, or think I've missed anything out, put it in the comments below. If you like my shirt, you can get it in the uh, Redbubble store uh, linked below. And I will see you next video.